Okay, um, good afternoon from London and good evening from Singapore, everybody. Um, my name is Stephen Murphy. I'm the moderator for today's, uh, this evening session, depending on where you are. Um, I'm senior lecturer at, um, in curating and museology at SOAS. I'm one of the uh, co-organizers of the lecture series, um, along with my uh, colleague, Conan Chong from the ACM. He's uh, also one of the speakers tonight. But yeah, this is the third uh, lecture in the series in the decolonizing curating and the museum in Southeast Asia. As I said, it's jointly run by both uh, the Asian Civilizations Museum in Singapore and the Southeast Asian Art Academic Program here at SOAS. Um, and also today, this lecture series is um, part of the ACM talk series supported by the Chris Foundation. So again, many thanks to them for their support as well as of course, um, Alpha Wood Foundation and, and the Asian Civilizations Museum. Before we get on to today's talk, just a quick overview of the series. Uh, we have, this is the third, as I said, but we have three more um, coming up um, in the next, on the next three Thursdays. Um, so do look out for them. You can scan the QR code here or go to um, either the ACM's website or the Center for Southeast Asian Studies at SOAS. Um, to sign up for them. And some of you have asked before, the, these are being recorded, so they will be uh, hosted on the um, uh, SOAS website. This is the uh, link to it. Tonight's one, because it's actually been broadcast from ACM, will also be on their Facebook page. And I think it's also been streamed live on Facebook now as well. So, that, so there's two locations where you'll be able to access that. Okay, without any further ado, um, let me introduce today's speakers and uh, and the and the talk itself. Okay, so we have um, tonight's talk is uh, must we decolonize the museum, sacred and ritual art, and the Raffles Museum collection in Singapore? Uh, we are very lucky to have uh, two active curators at ACM who are going to talk to us today. So we're going to have uh, hopefully some inside insight. I think it's really important in this session that, and this series that we're also hearing from practitioners or people actively working in the museum in Southeast Asia, um, as well as academics and, 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 and so forth. So yeah, we have uh, Conan Chung, who is um, the curator for Southeast Asia, and uh, Faisal Hosni, who is the assistant curator for Southeast Asia at the Asian Civilizations Museum. And um, they will speak for about 40 minutes. And then we have um, our fellow friend and colleague, uh, Sujata Arundhati Magima from NTU Singapore. And she will lead, she will act as respondent and, uh, and the discussion. So just a little bit of uh, background. Uh, Conan, um, as I said, he's uh, recently promoted as curator, full, to, full curator of Southeast Asia. So congratulations there. Um, special, he specializes in Hindu Buddhist art. He received an MA in Art History and Archaeology under the Alfred Scholarships at uh, SOAS University of London in 2018. Uh, he's been at the ACM since 2013, and his most recently, he's most recently curated uh, Living with Ink, the collection of Dr. Tan Chi uh, Cho, 2019, and Fashionable in Asia, 2021. Um, Faisal, Faisal Hosni is an assistant curator for Ireland Southeast Asia at the ACM. He holds an MA in research from the School of Art, Design and Media, Nanyang Technological University here in Singapore. Uh, his research interests include multi-religious and multicultural heritage and spaces of worship, as well as religious art and traditions of Southeast Asia with a focus on Karamat graves in Singapore and the Malay world. So without any further delay, I will hand over to both of you for tonight's talk. Uh, I think Conan, are you up first or is it? Great, yeah. okay, thanks. Great, thanks. Thanks, Stephen, for that, for that uh, introduction. And uh, hello, everyone. Thanks for tuning in today. It's great to see you all. Um, I'd like to thank uh, Alphabet Foundation and the Chris Foundation for generous support of this lecture series. Uh, Co-organizer Stephen, um, colleagues Denise and Jeff at uh, ACM, and uh, of course, all our speakers and discussants for making this collaboration uh, between SOAS and ACM on uh, decolonizing, curating in the museum, uh, such a productive one. Let me just share my screen. Um, so my colleague Faisal and I uh, today, uh, we are gonna, going to approach this question, uh, you know, must we decolonize the museum? Um, and I guess in some way it is a bit of a rhetorical question. Um, uh, uh, as uh, curators of the ACM in, in the Asian Civilizations Museum in Singapore, 
in terms of you know how can we enact uh, decoloniality in our uh, curatorial work, and um, so decoloniality following um, Walter Mignolo, as uh, you know Stephen Guerra and and Pamela in the previous talks in this series have uh, sort of cited, you know involves uh, the linking from uh, colonial structures of knowledge of which museums have been uh, a part of, uh, to recenter. Uh, local indigenous uh, and, and community experiences. And a big part of uh, curatorial work for me, um, the work of exhibition making, really involves uh, narrativization, uh, using artwork, uh, objects, material culture as nodal points to, to create uh, narratives about culture, civilizations, and, and history. Uh, and and you know, I think this is part of how you know, museums have been increasingly uh, acknowledging uh, our own subjectivity that it is impossible to have uh, an objective or a neutral um, uh, exhibition uh, space or gallery space. Um, you know, Sir Christian in his uh, 1977 publication uh, talks about how the image of the native constructed by colonialism uh, has been an impediment to a profound and genuine understanding of native life. Uh, and uh, you know, he, you know, Alatas kind of analyzes rhetorical images. Um, but these images of natives, of, of colonized peoples, I should say, uh, are often embedded in objects in museum collections, how they were collected and studied and, and exhibited. So to me, that's why it's crucial in our work at the ACM to, to bring um, local indigenous and, and community voices uh, in the way that we uh, create narratives with, with objects. So the ACM, uh, we are a national museum centered on uh, global connections and cross-cultural exchanges in Asia. Um, but we also inherited the uh, what was called the ethnological collections of the 19th century uh, Raffles Library and Museum. Uh, and with the sort of transformation of the Raffles Museum and Library into uh, the National Museum, uh, when, when Singapore gained uh, independence from the British, uh, there was a shift from colonial narratives to, to narratives that would serve the fledgling Singapore state. Uh, and, and so this can be kind of considered a, a state directed um, decolonization. I work on, on Hindu and Buddhist art at, at the ACM. And actually most of our collection of uh, Hindu and Buddhist art uh, here seen in, in our you know, ancient religions gallery on, on the second floor were in fact not inherited from the Raffles uh, Museum Library and actually acquired by the ACM uh, after it was conceived uh, in the nineties with a mission to represent the, the ancestral cultures of, of Singapore. And of course, religion is, is regarded as a, as a key aspect of, of heritage of Singapore, uh, of the heritage of, of these new, uh, newly created citizens of Singapore. Uh, so they were acquired really to, to represent uh, Buddhists and Hindus uh, in Singapore. The notable exception actually uh, are the uh, Bujang Valley finds uh, from, from Kedah, which were excavated by uh, Dorothy and H.G. Parts Wales uh, in the 30s and, and, and 1941. Um, and these uh, clay ceilings um, from, from the Thai Malay Peninsula. And uh, right now we, we have them in a showcase in our ancient religion galleries um, called Southeast Asia, the arrival of Hinduism and Buddhism. And they're kind of being used to, to show uh, the earliest traces of Hinduism and, and Buddhism in, in Southeast Asia. And, and this, uh, display is something that I've been trying to, to reassess. Um, and I kind of want to talk about uh, these clay tablets to, to illustrate the kind of research that, that, that perhaps cur curators and, and other you know, interested researchers can do on the collection um, in uh, documenting the histories of how objects were really collected and interpreted. Uh, and, and through doing this, we can perhaps identify the colonial narratives that may be uh, embedded in them uh, and, and then you know, depart from these narratives or to put other narratives, you know, community voices, local voices in, in dialogue uh, with them. Um, so very, very briefly, because this is not going to be the, the main subject of my uh, talk, um, what are these uh, ceilings? They are images of the Buddha made in large quantities uh, by the application of molds to, to wet clay um, to create merit for a better rebirth uh, for, for Buddhist practitioners. And they're often also stamped on the back with uh, the so-called Ye Dharma uh, st stanza, which is a teaching of the Buddha about causation as uh, Peter Skilling has, has written about. Um, and many of them on the Thai Malay Peninsula were, were found in caves. And there's something about these tablets uh, in the Raffles Museum's collection. This is just sort of uh, you know, what, what is in the collection. 
you know, even though they, they form such a small proportion of his collection, and you know, the Raffles Museum was focused on zoology and ethnography, um, they, they received kind of a disproportionate amount of attention as objects of study. Um, you know, often referred to in, in scholarly journals uh, of the time, the colonial period, uh, and were frequently the subject of inquiry in, in correspondence with the museum. And one example, I, I found um, some Raffles Museum correspondence from uh, 1939, uh, where E.H. Johnston, who uh, a, a professor of Sanskrit at the University of Oxford, uh, is you know, kind of desperate to borrow objects from the Raffles Museum he can use to show how the, Mil the Malay Peninsula was actually part of a greater India. You know, the very tenacious idea that, that Southeast Asia uh, was colonized and civilized uh, by uh, ancient India in the sort of golden age. Um, but, you know, uh, Evan Chazin, the director of the museum at the time, uh, says, you know, Indian antiquities are so scarce in the Malay Peninsula in here that uh, they are all treated as very precious stones. And, you know, he wishes that he's asked, he, you know, he will ask for anything else, even, even gold. Um, which you know I, I find quite interesting. Uh, so so how do we really make begin to make sense of this? Um, Diana Carroll has uh, uh, identified the the pattern of British scholarship in the Malay, Malay Peninsula in the nineteenth century, uh, where Islam was dismissed in favor of uh, Hindu Buddhist elements, which were taken as uh, signs of civilization, uh, and the primitive uh, native or Aboriginal. Uh, elements, which kind of tied in with uh, you know, the idealization of the noble savage and, and folklore studies, which are very um, uh, uh, you know, gaining ground at the time. Uh, and so this Hindu Buddhist, uh, these Hindu Buddhist elements that were found by men like uh, Marsden and, and Raffles, uh, plugged the Malay Peninsula into these, uh, the international network of antiquarians who were, were studying these things. Um, and so how does this really play out at the Raffles uh, Museum itself? So, you know, first of all, as Carol notes, uh, significant Hindu Buddhist uh, archaeological remains, monuments were actually not found in the Malay Peninsula. And so there are very few opportunities, opportunities to collect uh, with the notable uh, exceptions that I've already addressed. Um, and the museum was divided into zoology and ethnology. The galleries were organized as such. Um, but at the same time, the search kind of continued for for material remains of Hindu Buddhist presence in Malaya to try and link uh, contemporary Malays to the Indian civilizations. And so even though these clay tablets, uh, when they entered the collection, they were usually classified under uh, ethnology, they didn't quite fit. Uh, they were seen as something uh, greater, some uh, as traces of this uh, civilizing mission of the greater uh, India. And I, I find this sort of disjuncture quite interesting in how uh, these, these uh, objects were, were seen. So the first period where we really see the tablets coming into the Raffles Museum collection uh, is at the turn of the 20th century, around 1893 to 1904, collected by uh, Kenneth Lee, Vaughn Stevens, uh, and um, A.D. Machado. And uh, you know, the, this kind of collecting was very opportunistic. It was a kind of casual collecting that took place where when these uh, colonial administrators, these explorers, uh, prospectors were engaged in other forms of activity. Uh, and you know, zooming in on, on these two tablets, and I, I can't you know, find them in our collection uh, right now, um, but uh, they were, so they're not, you know, they don't seem, there isn't really a record of them at the moment, um, but they were given uh, actually by the tin prospector, A.D. Machado, um, by all accounts the most uh, enthusiastic give up objects to the Raffles Museum. Um, and this is a list of what he donated in 1896. Um, you know, this, the Siamese coins and images, which probably include these two, uh, and other things like mineralogical specimens, gold quartz and tin ore, Chinese guns, uh, a skull of a, a Pangan Aboriginal a baskets, and so on. Um, and, 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 you know, it seems like a very eclectic range of objects. Uh, and not everything that uh, was published in these uh, records can be found in our records today, uh, including the skull. Um, but here are some other things that he donated to the museum, uh, which is uh, collected in, in Pahang. These are objects that are associated with uh, tribal communities living in Pahang uh, at the time. And Machado was a prospector uh, associated with the Malayan uh, Pahang Exploration Company. And so this is how he kind of came into contact with these tribal communities and collected these objects. So, you know, from this kind of little case study, uh, 
you know, it's, it's kind of reflective of a wider context uh, of, of scholarship in the, in, in the Malay world, uh, of the Malay world at this time, uh, at the turn of the 20th century, with the growing interest in, in studying you know, wild tribes or pagan races, as, as these um, communities were called. And to be more correct, we should refer to them by the, by the names, you know, the Semai, Tamiya, Batek, and, and other communities. Uh, and there was a kind of urgency as well, uh, where the British uh, scholar administrators believed that their original culture, the original culture of the Malay Peninsula was actually dying out due to contact, not just with the West, uh, but also the Indian, Chinese, and even you know, Malay um, civilization. Um, and, and this also kind of, the, the Raffles Museum was kind of caught up in this as well, uh, these developments. In 1903, um, you know, rooms in the upper floor, floor of the museum were actually refurnished and opened to the galleries, uh, opened to the public as ethnological galleries. And you know, in the bulletin, they're said to be the best lit and ventilated rooms in the museum, uh, together with new showcases, and they appear much more attractive than the other galleries. In uh, 1906, uh, this is the publication of the research um, of uh, Skeet and Blavins, um the Pagan Races of the Malay Peninsula, which was the first attempt by professional researchers to kind of systematize uh, observ all these observations made uh, by, by colonial administrators and travelers of these communi uh, tribal communities. So it, it re reflected a kind of turning point in how uh, they were being studied. Um, so moving on to another set of fragments in our, in our um, ACM collection uh, that were collected in the Raffles Museum period. Uh, these fragments that were found in, in Perlis, uh, and they're interesting because um, uh, in, in, it appears that, um, according to Gibson Hill, who was uh, later director of the Raffles Museum as well, uh, in the display in the label, uh, we kind of mixed up uh, 17 objects, 17 of these fragments given by Vaughan Stevens in 1893, so part of this earlier period that we've been talking about. Uh, and they were mixed in with uh, 22 collected by H.D. Collings, uh, who was a curator at the Raffles Museum uh, in 1937. So I've not really been able to uh, inspect these in person yet. Um, so in, in formal terms, you know, they, they look exactly the same, made of this reddish clay and also impressed with these uh, Buddhist motifs. Um, this later collection by colleagues actually reflects uh, a shift in how the Malay Peninsula was being studied in the 30s. Uh, Collings had, you know, collected these in, in Pardis, which was a British protectorate at the time. Uh, and as part of a major three-year archaeological survey of the prehistory of the Malay Peninsula uh, in, in the states of Kedah, Pahang, uh, Kelantan, Perak, and, and Perlis. And, you know, interestingly, this points, you know, at, uh, this, this is because in the 1935 um, uh, Congress of Prehistorians of the Far East held in Manila, the Raffles Museum was actually selected to be kind of the repository for uh, prehistoric objects from the whole of the Further East. And coming with this was also a funding from the Carnegie Corporation of New York. Uh, they, the museum was actually awarded uh, 12,000 US dollars, at the time 20,000 in, in straits currency, uh, for the museum to do this uh, three-year uh, prehistoric survey. And part of the money also funded new showcases for uh, a new hall of Asiatic uh, prehistory. And the motivation behind this is, you know, kind of out of my scope for now, but suffice to say that this connection with, you know, Asiatic prehistory um, plugged the museum into another far-ranging uh, scholarly network. Uh, and, and records show that in the next few years, uh, fossils, casts of ancient men, uh, typological series of uh, stone implements uh, were started to circulate in from, from the Parak Museum, the Australian Museum, uh, Oyama Institute in Japan, um, and, and the Museum of Archaeology and Ethnology in, in Cambridge, among others, to furnish these, uh, th these new uh, galleries. So Collings actually sent, well, okay, Collings actually sent these fragments he found to, to Georges uh, Sedes at the EFEO in Hanoi. And Sedes's reply, where he identifies and kind of classifies these, these objects, uh, these fragments are, are published in the bulletin uh, for that year. And that's, a, that's just a page from, from Collins's um, archaeological report in the bulletin. Um, and, you know, this is, you know, indicative of, of this connection that was forged through, through the Hindu Buddhist, um, uh, the interest in Hindu Buddhist elements of, of the Malay Peninsula. 
Um, Sadez known, you know, more for his known most for his popularization of the Indian Indianization theory of um, Southeast Asia, wrote a much cited uh, comprehensive survey article in 1926, which was titled uh, Siamese uh, Voted Tablets, where he he furthered Fouché's theory that these tablets are souvenirs for pilgrims. So I don't really have time to critique this theory. And in any case, uh, Peter Skilling, again, has done, uh, done so in a series of articles. Um, but what I want to point out today is that at the end of the article, uh, Sedes writes that um, it was Prince Damrong, who's known as the, the father of you know, kind of modern art history, uh, or art history in, in the, the Western tradition in, in Thailand, was the one who, who actually consolidated uh, all the tablets, all such tablets uh, dispersed in private collections in Thailand, which you can imagine uh, coming also from different temple collections uh, into the National Museum collection. So the Museum of the Royal Institute is the, the National Museum of uh, Bangkok today. And uh, you know, Damrong and Sedes uh, was interested in these things as art historical objects and tried to class classify them according to uh, scientific you know, principles. Um, but you know, this actually, to me, hints at how they were actually collected and, and valued all over Thailand, you know, even before, uh, before this uh, consolidation. And, and so, you know, in the, the, fast, the, light, the, light, the final part of my uh, presentation, I just want to use uh, this chance maybe to, to hint at some alternative narratives about these clay tablets that can be read in dialogue uh, with the Hindu Buddhist traces. Um, so Annandale, uh, who's an ethnolo ethnologist in 1904, reports how the uh, local people in Yala province, who, who, uh, uh, who were Muslim, uh, actually believed that these Hantu Parai spirits uh, were, uh, made the, these Buddhist tablets that were found in many of the caves. Um, in 1964, Alistair Lam, who uh, in the 60s did uh, a number of uh, excavations in the Malay Peninsula, uh, also looking for Hindu Buddhist uh, elements, um, um, tried to do a scientific examination of a cave in Perlis where, where these clay tablets were found, uh, but was you know, sorely disappointed because uh, nearby Buddhist monks regarding the clay tablets as, as sacred, uh, actually collected all of them and removed them to the temple where they ground them up to serve as material for, for a new image. So, you know, he, he came away very um, uh, disappointed not being able to you know, determine the stratigraphic relationship of the tablets in the cave to the rest of the cave deposit, as he says. Um, so it's, it's interesting to me how these are um, you know, hints in the, the record of, of these um, uh, you know, academics and scholars in the articles of, of alternative viewpoints, alternative narratives that uh, they kind of chose to, to downplay or to uh, ignore. Uh, and of course, uh, you can't avoid uh, talking about the connection of these clay tablets to the, you know, the, the popularity of the cult of amulets in Thailand, which actually kind of arose in the reign of uh, Mongkut and, and Chua Long Khorn. So, you know, the clay tablets were not originally used as, as uh, amulets, of course, but they became kind of incorporated into this uh, new cult of amulets. Um, and uh, as uh, uh, you know, uh, Pataraton Chirapravati, who uh, spoke uh, in, in our first lecture of the series, uh, wrote, um, they, they are kind of, they, the practice of uh, you know, stamping these loaded tablets uh, uh, actually you know, continues in this new uh, uh, passion for, for amulets. In our um, 2012 uh, exhibition, Enlightened Ways, uh, which was curated by, by Heidi Tan, um, and you know where we borrowed many objects from from museums in Thailand, uh, we also you know had a had a section on on these living traditions that uh, in, in Thailand in, in Buddhist Thailand, uh, and with a showcase of these these amulets. Uh, so you know it's really important to 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 show um, the continuation of these uh, traditions in in in, uh, in contemporary form. So just to kind of finish. Uh, on this slide, actually, um, just wanted to to say that yeah, in, in so in in twenty eighteen the ACM we we've uh, completed a sort of major renovation and renewal of our permanent galleries, and as part of this we we inaugurated uh, our second floor faith and belief galleries uh, with galleries dedicated not just to Hinduism, Buddhism, and 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 you know, Jainism, but also the ritual sacred ritual art of uh, other religions. 
uh, in major religions in Asia, in Southeast Asia, um, you know, including Christianity, Islam, Taoism, and Confucianism, and, and communities like the Batak, Dayak, and so on. And you know, we are we are, you know work, working very closely with uh, local communities uh, in Singapore for showcases on on Sikhism, Judaism, and Zoroastrianism. And so perhaps this could uh, be a good transition to, to Faisal's presentation um, to say that you know, we've been working uh, and you know, our other departments at ACM as well, including uh, you know, our audience team uh, who made this really wonderful video uh, featuring members of the interreligious organization in Singapore um, you know, reacting and, and kind of adopting our uh, objects in our collection um, as a possibility to uh, how we can kind of encourage um, the insertion or the incorporation of, of uh, multiple narratives, multiple voices uh, in our, the way we, we talk about uh, sacred ritual art at the museum. Uh, yeah, so with that, uh, let me pass the time on to Faisal. Let me stop sharing here. Okay, hi everyone, thank you so much. Uh, I'd like to firstly thank Alpha Wood Foundation and the Chris Foundation, uh, like um, Conan has mentioned, uh, also to SOAS and Stephen and all our colleagues, including especially Denise for helping us uh, with this. So um, I have been an assistant curator here at ACM for barely a year actually, November will be my first year. However, I still hope I can offer some insights uh, into what we do and what we have done and all our approaches and our aims to decolonize uh, the collection um, and the museum. And to the title, must we decolonize the museum? As Conan mentioned, uh, you know, it's a rhetorical question. So in my opinion, yes, we should. The question is how? Um, as Conan has beautifully described the history of Raffles Library and Museum collection, I don't have to go through it again. Because if I did, I wouldn't have been able to do it as elegantly. But one thing I wish to highlight is that some of the uh, records of um, the uh, some of the objects have records uh, that include payments or purchases uh, or mentions of purchases. And by, by records, I mean it would usually just say it was bought by so and so from so and so. However, if these can be accepted as factual and correct, then you know there are some objects that were actually purchased. Uh, though this was not information that was uh, available for like all of the objects, there's only some if we're lucky. Uh, this is with regards to the Raffles Library and Museum collection. And also that means I can't make bold claims about looting or violent means of acquiring these objects in the past, but we can just acknowledge the possibility. Besides, even if the acquiring um, isn't violent, the way they were displayed and categorized can be argued as violent. Um, and there also seems to be a tradition of traveling and collecting and contribute that, um, that contributed to the amassing of this collection. So individuals connected to the library and museum would go around Southeast Asia and collect objects and bring them back. And in, uh, in the collection, we also have ethnographic photographs that are undeniably problematic. Uh, these are obviously evidence of ethnographic and anthropological endeavors. Uh, and these could also have led to the collecting of objects uh, another thing I wish to add also is that ACM currently resides in, uh, in what, is, what was a, an old colonial governmental office building, and in, it used to house a number of governmental offices and departments, including, ironically or not, um, the, the immigration department uh, at some point. And I'm still trying to figure out which room or gallery this space was, because it would be interesting, uh, a space to conduct curatorial interventions on the other and who gets othered in a throughout history. So yes, the Southeast Asian collection is dripping with colonial legacies and histories, and we have to really work hard to address and decolonize the collection and the museum. And uh, this also goes for objects that are acquired after the division of the Raffles Library and Museum collection, uh, and also the formation of ACM. Um, and as I mentioned, I'm very new to this role. Uh, so my work and these approaches are still in their beginning stages or haven't seen their fruits yet but I shall share some of the initiatives ACM has done that are in line with the efforts and ethos of decolonizing, and also some examples from other institutions and organizations that I feel are worth emulating. We are currently working on a 
project that we have unoriginally called uh, the National Collection Research Project. And this is uh, something that a few museums in Singapore are doing with, with our Heritage and Conservation Center. Uh, for those who may not know, most of the museums in Singapore are national museums. So all of our collections are part of the Singapore's national collection, which are then subdivided into the different museum collections. And one of the aims of this project, at least for us at ACM, is to research on the old Raffles Library and Museum collection within ACM's larger collection. And we have a couple of researchers that's, uh, who are working on this with me. Uh, a little shout out to them, Shaul Cheng and Kairul Jafni Jukri. And what they've been doing is to relook at write-ups meant for the online data, our online database based on newer scholarship and also local and regional scholarship. Uh, and we start seeing some instances where earlier often very old writings or curator notes that may be uninformed, to put it gently. And I've seen, for example, uh, earlier older notes from the collection describing an image from Java as an ogre, when it's most likely actually one of the comedic archetypes of the Javanese theater traditions. Uh, another example I like to use is the, is the chili because it's the simplest to illustrate this problem, uh, the chili from Bali. Firstly, it has been labeled as rice spirit, uh, and this is obviously not correct, uh, or at the very least, it doesn't correctly describe what a chili is, which is an offering, but it's also, it could also be a form of residence for a deity, not a spirit, but a deity, the goddess Dewi Sri, namely. But at the same time, there may be people within the Balinese community um, who may not view the form as being specifically for dedicated to Dewi Sri because the Balinese traditions and the traditions of Balinese Hinduism is diverse and very plural. And the religious and ritual complexity of the object is absent and cannot be described in rice spirit. So uh, the entry will eventually be updated to use the term rice chili, uh, to, to, to use the term chili as the object name and then a write up that reflects the newer and local scholarship of the material because there have been so much research on such materials since this object was acquired in 1918 apparently. And it's a no brainer right that we have to keep updating such content but it can, I have to admit it, it sounds pretty daunting if, you if, if we have such a large collection. Another reason why looking at local scholarship I feel is so important is that they often involve community interviews, surveys, and most importantly, perspectives. And these are lacking in most earlier Western scholarship, um, especially the perspectives and the voices. Um, we should also look at writings and research in local or regional languages specifically. Uh, with the Chile, for example, um, I research in Bahasa Indonesia was very, very useful from some of the universities in Indonesia. Uh, I remember um, having a discussion with this with some people uh, and someone mentioning, what if we just can't assess the language, we don't know the language? And I think that's where collaboration would come in. Um, I think it was Professor Nancy Um from Binghamton University who pointed out that in the field of heart sciences and medicine, for example, collaboration is instinctive, uh, expected even. So I think our field should uh, it should be the same for our field, you know, we should collaborate across the globe. You'll also find with regards to study of objects in this region, you can find the same claims being made of certain objects uh, about something and then discover that it reaches all the way back from citation to citation, from publication to publication, uh, to Western sources or colonial writings that may or may not have taken into consideration community perspectives and the diversity of these perspectives. And sadly, these uh, claims often become solidified and taken as fact. And to use the chili again, you'll often read about how the chili image, like on this lama, is representative of the goddess Dewi Sri. But thankfully, through local research that actually engaged with the Balinese communities, you'll realize that it's not a homogenous belief at all, um, that some people um, have differing uh, opinions within the community about who, the, the, who or what the figure represents. And uh, another thing uh, this project has highlighted is also the fallibility of translations, especially to English. Uh, firstly, I think this prioritizing of English, uh, English terms specifically, needs to stop. We, we can be okay, if we can be okay with terms like kimono to be untranslated, we can work toward, uh, towards uh, chili, for example, being untranslated, or even sirahasalawa or hampatong, or we could use those local 
words and terms first and then spend time and text explaining them after and make this way of um, education uh, a norm. Because often you can't translate uh, things perfectly in just a word or two as substitutes. Uh, and sometimes in doing so, you layer additional meaning over the subject. Uh, for example, when translating Rakshasa to demons, or uh, worse, describing uh, the goddess Rangda as a witch, which doesn't work. And also the words come with so much baggage um, from Western traditions. Another word I, I, I think we should stop using with regards to Southeast Asia is magic. Uh, and I've seen this used countless times to describe traditions, uh, especially religious traditions in Southeast Asia. And that comes obviously with so much problems. Uh, uh, another word, uh, and Kone has mentioned this earlier as well, that uh, tribe is another word I, I often avoid um, for very good reasons. I've also encouraged the researchers to use regionally appropriate uh, or specific terms where possible or relevant um, so a Chris Blade, for example, say from Kelantan, the community might refer to, to it as Bila Chris. However, communities in Java, for example, depending on the community, they might call it a Wila instead, Wila Chris. Uh, the sheath, collectively, they might often be called Sarung, but depending on the communities in Indonesia, they might specifically call it a Waranka. So uh, yeah, I think the specificity is very important. And and then we'll just add the English term as a means of explaining, but not replacing those local terms and those uh, very specific terms. But yes, the priority is on the local terms. I actually want to go further than this and end the italicizing of non-English terms, but I've been told that's way too radical for now, but there is a logic to it. Um, it's one of the small ways in which writing, you know, writing others a community. Uh, so maybe we should. Um, Anyways, this project is currently ongoing, but it's grounded in our aims to decolonize the collection and the museum. Uh, and one of our efforts to ensure that we don't uh, only rely on certain sources of knowledge, and Conan again has uh, mentioned this earlier, and when I, when I mean rely on certain not sources of knowledge, I mean like Western sources, colonial sources, or even just scholarly sources in general. Uh, the way to do it is to work with communities. And we have, as uh, we mentioned earlier, I worked with the inter-religious uh, organization, IRO, here in Singapore, where possible to ensure that the objects that uh, of the different faiths and religions are presented and represented as sensitively as possible. Um, and this working with communities is useful uh, and necessary so that we don't repeat this top-down approach or we know better approach of colonial museums and scholarship or older uh, museums and scholarship because we don't always know better, right? Uh, sometimes even our visitors and our audience can be our teachers and our experts as well. And something I've been trying to do is to reach out to a few communities in Southeast Asia or organizations within the regions that are locally run or work closely with the communities. I have to admit, starting some of these relationships during the pandemic has been difficult. I've been successful in some attempts and I've been able to gain community perspectives and information. Um, Others, however, I'm still working to um, gain their trust so that we can eventually work together uh, and um, work with them on future collaborations where all parties have a say and stake in it and how they benefit from these collaborations and not just the museums benefiting from it. Some of the organizations I wish to highlight include uh, Ranuelum Foundation, a nonprofit organization that helps communities in Kalimantan, but also work in educating people about traditional practices of the different and diverse Dayak communities. And also uh, they focus a lot on environmental preservation and protection. Another organization is Threats of Life that does work with different local textile makers and highlight their practices and stories. And while my efforts are still in their infancy stages, many other institutions have done very successful collaborations with communities. And I won't go into too much details on them because my fanboying would take up an entire hour. But I do encourage you to look them up. The first is the Ohio State University Center for Folklore Studies. And they have very interesting community collaborations with communities from Appalachian, Ohio. Uh, there are talks by Dr. Jasper Wall Kozabath you can easily find on YouTube. Uh, that describes the initiatives in detail. And the ethos behind, behind these collaborations is that the researcher is a learner and an apprentice. Uh, 
and not the expert and that the relationship is reciprocal and a focus from just being an observer to a relationship where exchanges can happen. One of these initiatives encourage students and student researchers to work with and for different community organizations to assist in building uh, local archives that would serve the communities, be accessible to the communities easily, and could be easily run by these communities if or when the researchers would have to leave. Uh, another initiative uh, that I really admire is that they, they found ways to uh, bring local community members as experts where non-academics would often not be able to assess like conferences or lectures. So if we ever have future iterations of the program that we have today, uh, we should consider bringing in members from the different communities and have them talk uh, and speak. Uh, another amazing initiative I admire is the Reentanglements Project, uh, which is a collaboration or partnership uh, between SOAS, led by Dr. Paul Basu and other institutions, including University of Nigeria and Suka, Igbo Studies Initiative, University of Cambridge, Institute of Benin Studies, University College London, Nasuna Studios, National Museum Lagos, University of Benin, Auchi Polytechnic, British Libraries on Archives, the Pitt Rivers Museum, the Royal Anthropological Institute, the Royal Botanic Gardens, QN, UK National Archives. I feel like it was it's only fair that I mentioned all of them. Anyway, one of their projects uh, from this initiative is the Faces Voices Project, where all anthropological photographs from surveys of Nigeria and Sierra Leone are presented to contemporary participants from the communities to respond to them, who they think the people in the photographs were, what they did, how they felt giving voice to the voiceless. And my favorite bit was um, also uh, a part where these participants were presented with the photographs of the anthropolo anthropologist himself. And um, ACM has a collection of ethnographic photographs and I've been trying to figure out how to address them and work with them. And this project has, uh, I think, provided uh, one solution, uh, one possible approach. Another way we have been working with communities and working to make sure that their voices are presented, especially as experts, uh, is through the acquiring uh, of objects from them not just from auction houses or dealers. And this has been a part of the collection strategies of ACM over the lifespan of ACM. And it still is. Um, one significant example is from one of our earlier research projects uh, where video documentation was done on the making of this very Plantanese Chris made by Nick Rashidi Nick Hussein, who is the brother of Nick Rashidi Nick Hussein, who is um, uh, a renowned and acclaimed Chris maker and wood carver, and also Mazlan Mutt, who was the metal smith here. The good thing about collecting from the community is that we get the names of the makers so we can highlight them. This sets our method methodology a bit apart from the colonial approaches of collecting from the community where the makers often remain anonymous. Instead, the collectors are the ones highlighted. Uh, the documentation also allowed us to, uh, to show the process or to view the process and document the process. We also get snippets of conversations of the makers while they chatted uh, as they work if you can understand Klantani's uh, Malay, of course. It is, I admit, a, um, a little voyeuristic, so I, I have to admit that, but it, does re it did reveal interesting perspectives of these bakers. Uh, they had very pointed opinions, for example, of uh, young Malay youths in Singapore. And um, our director, Kenny Ting, is very supportive of what we call collecting the contemporary. Um, and these include objects from the communities. Uh, it also allows us to compare older objects with their newer counterparts to discuss possible evolutions of traditions. Um, currently, the Ancestor and Rituals Gallery here at ACM has this monumental responsibility of housing objects from Southeast Asia, um, excluding the ones uh, that are Hindu, Buddhist, Islamic, or Islamicate, and Christian. And our approach currently at the moment is to display the objects of each culture or community in its own space. And this, the aim is to allow each culture to be able to be addressed within their own context, yet still acknowledge possible diversities and to not present a homogenous Southeast Asia or hodgepodge approach or what the Singaporeans or people of the region would call Roja. But of course, the downside is that some of the connections between the different communities become diminished. Um, and some of these communities have been interacting with one another way before colonialism came to the picture. They were trading, they were um, intermarrying, they were sometimes in conflict. 
So we are always aiming to improve our approach, but I guess even if this, the perfect approach is not reached at the moment, the, the space is still valuable in initiating conversations, perspectives, and even criticisms. And these are all valuable information we are constantly absorbing. I especially appreciate talking to students about the space because the younger generation of academics and researchers, they're they are so much more in tune with conversations about colonialism and decolonizing of museums and knowledge in general, and they have very interesting take on things. Uh, I also feel that galleries and exhibitions cannot shoulder everything or the heavy lifting of decolonizing. Tours are very useful ways to help push out alternative narratives. Uh, when I speak to our wonderful docents, I encourage them to relate alternative narratives and invisible connections uh, between the different communities when, you know, spatially in the gallery, the objects of these communities might be far apart. Um, lectures like what we have today is another way we, we, we could do that. Um, we also have programs where we bring out objects and give longer talks about them when labels do not have the sufficient textual real estate to do so. And many museums have done this. We're not the only ones, um, hardly the first one as well. Um, one of the, my favorites is the Curator's Corner by the British Museum. Um, but of course, the methodology of the programming here is not where the decolonizing happened. It's the knowledge and it's information. They need to be current as far as possible and also from local and regional scholarship as much as possible, especially those that work with local communities and in their languages. Because um, decolonizing cannot happen if the community voices and agencies are still bottled and not part of the process. They need to be participants in this and not just subjects of study. Uh, and that's where I end. Thank you so much. I think uh, I see Thank you. you. Yeah, sorry. <laughs> Thank you, Faisal. I was getting so caught up in your talk, you caught me unawares. Um, yeah, that's great. Thank you to both Conan and Faisal um, for their excellent overviews within the very short time limit. Um, yeah, we we're going to have a, about a 20 minute um, discussion and response um, before we then um, turn to the Q&As from, from the, um, the audience. So, um, but I, so I'd like to and that note, introduce our um, discussant for today. It's um, Professor, Assistant Professor Sujata Arundhati Magima. Um, she's at the Nanyan, Nanyan Technological Institute um, in Singapore. She trained at Temple University, Japan, Stanford University, and the University of California, Berkeley. Uh, prior to joining NTU, she worked um, at the Art Institute of Chicago. Uh, she is the editor of Sri Lanka Connected Art Histories, that's Mumbai 2017, and she has published articles in Artibus Essia and Archives of Asian Art. Currently, she is completing a book manuscript on the transnational Dravidia tradition of architecture in the Indian Ocean. So, Sujatha, over to you. Thank you, Stephen, um, for your introduction, and um, good morning. And um, good, e good afternoon, good evening to all of you who are joining from all over the world. And um, a big thank you to Stephen, uh, Conan and Faisal for um, inviting me to be part of this exciting uh, conversation on decolonizing museums in Southeast Asia. I'm going to try to um, um, share a few brief um, comments as part of a response and then um, um, have a conversation with um, Conan and Faisal about their um, uh, thought-provoking talks. I'm just going to try to figure out how to share my screen. Okay, I think that's done. So um, my very first encounter with the Asian Civilizations Museum was in 1999 when I was passing through Singapore on my way back to my then job and home um, at the Art Institute of Chicago. The ACM was then located at the Town and School, uh, the former Town and School, a three-story building from 1910, funded by Chinese merchants, as well as through a public donation drive. This is the home of the first modern Chinese school on this island. I was seeing the ACM two years after its opening at this location on Armenian Street. Then in 2003, 
the ACM moved to its current location on the banks of um, the Singapore River to a national monument. Um, dating to 1867, the Empress Place building is a colonial garment structure, as was shared before by um, um, the curators, which was built by Indian convict labor. As Dr. Kinson Kwok, the first director of the ACM says, quote, the Asian Civilization Museum is both a very young and a very old museum, end of quote. He, of course, is alluding to the many lives of this museum, whose seed collection, as we heard from both um, Conan and Faisal, began with the Raffles Library and Museum. The ACM certainly has had many lives, and its identity is still changing, as we heard in the current director, Kenny Ting's call for decolonization at the beginning of this webinar series. So in my ruminations today, I will briefly trace these many lives and then um, um, at the end, I'll hope to have um, a conversation with Conan and Faisal about um, some of the issues that they brought up um, in their talks. We often read that unlike other museums of the wider region, the ACM is not a museum that focuses on telling a story about the nation state, but is instead dedicated to presenting Asian art and culture. And yet, from its inception, it was to promote a great appreciation of the ancestral cultures of Singaporeans. In its first incarnation at the former Taunan School, the emphasis was on Chinese civilization, which was justified by then director Kenson Kwok due to availability of loans from Hong Kong, as well as the demographics in Singapore. In its next incarnation, as an Asian art museum at the Empress Place, the ACM followed the traditional organization of most Asian art museums in the world. It was organized into four regional clusters, China, Southeast Asia, South Asia, and West Asia. Cultures were compartmentalized and displayed with clear boundaries. These divisions also invoked the CMIO model, Chinese, Malay, Indian, and other, although the other was uh, not present. This diversity management technique or a tool of social control has been present on this island since the British colonial period. Although the term national is not part of the ACM's formal name, the idea of the nation was and is still very much present, not only in the museum's mission, but also on the ground in the um, physical um, galleries. In the ideas of Asia and the museum, Sonia Esley points out how most museums are organized by court, geography with the intention of reflecting the work's purported place of origin, end of quote. In the second incarnation, the ASM clearly reflected this geography-based organization through its galleries and collecting practices. Moreover, the exhibition designs created by GSM um, design further contextualize the artworks in various ways to reveal their uses or the location that they would have been originally seen in. The display evokes South Indian temples with their long cleared halls where dancers performed offerings to the deity in the central sanctum. Chinese Buddhist steles were placed in dark alcoves with projections of Chinese cave temples, as well as sacred beings that made visitors feel as if they in, were indeed stepping into a sacred site in China. Cambodian lintels were displayed above eye level with projections of a Cambodian temple above. A visitor was given a chance to enter a temple-like space to study or worship a central image while circumambulating and viewing other sculptures. In the Islamic gallery, a projection of a mirab gave visitors a sense of the interiors of a mosque as objects related to a mosque were displayed. In short, these galleries were simply stunning. But in 2014, all this changed when the ACM embarked on another new journey. The new ACM moves away from the geography-based mode of display. Under the guidance of its second director, Dr. Alan Chong, the ASEAN began to display objects in a new way, that is along the shared themes of trade, faith and belief, and materials and design. 
This revamping phases include a change in the museum's mission, that is focusing on, quote, historical connections between cultures and civilizations in Asia and between Asia and the world, end of quote. Yet the ASTM's new curatorial narratives reflect Singapore's own history of trade and migration as a port city. In other words, the nation state is still very much present as an underlying narrative. The new direction was publicly revealed through a special exhibition in 2013, Devotion and Desire Cross-Cultural Art in Asia. A series of exhibitions since then has explored the global term in various ways. The Tang Shipwreck, China Mania, Christianity in Asia, Port Cities, Angkor, and Raffles in Southeast Asia, just to name a few. In the introductory essay for the catalog for that inaugural exhibition in 2013, Alan Chong, the then director of the ACM, challenges the emphasis on national narratives that are often seen at museums throughout the world. In its questioning of national narratives, the ACM has begun to engage with um, global art histories, which narrate stories beyond the nation state as a unit of analysis. Here I'm reminded of Mary D. Sheriff's imaginary visit to a museum in her edited volume, um, cultural contact and the making of European art. And I'm just um, sharing that with you. Um, she begins by describing the various rituals we participate in when we um, visit a museum, like buying a ticket, um, grabbing a map, and um, then rushing around from room to room to catch uh, as many ob objects as we can before we have museum fatigue. She ends by saying, quote, when your circuit seems complete, you again consult the floor plan just to make sure you have seen it all. And now you notice that there is a department of Islamic art one floor up and that the arts of China and Latin America are located in an entirely different building, end of quote. But in the new ACM, a French sugar caster is placed alongside a Chinese Imari sugar caster, which in turn is engaging the then craze for Japanese Imari wear. In the new ACM, we can see the proclamation that bans Christianity in Japan, along with the Tang Dynasty wrapping that mentions the arrival of Christianity in China. The world is in one vitrine, in one gallery, or on one floor. This initiative to engage with the global could be interpreted as a move to decolonize as well. First and foremost, it is a move to distance the museum from the CMIO model, a classification system that began 100 years ago. This engagement with the global turn moreover reminds us that this was indeed art histories, that is the discipline's own solution to decolonize itself. That is a deep and sustained critique of its Eurocentric priorities. That is questioning the centers, canons, models, and including or inviting bodies and new voices. The project of global art is often confused with non-Western art history. It is also not a narrative about East meets West. Neither does global art history entail taking the whole globe as a framework of analysis. What then is global art history? To simply put it, it is about going beyond the nation state and creating narratives that straddle traditional boundaries and proposes innovative comparisons. That is what we see in these new galleries at the ACM. And it also gives us an opportunity to discuss art produced during the colonial encounter and to even discuss colonialism. It also gives us a chance to go beyond the traditional canon as we heard in Conan and Faisal's um, talks. In this dramatic transformation of the ACM, we have a unique example of an Asian art museum that is a museum in Asia, playing an active role in initiating changes to the display of Asian art histories. We need to recognize and acknowledge it. But as Monica Juniger reminds us, engaging with global art histories also means to engage with the incommensurability of encounters. Any museum has objects forcibly taken or objects that remind us of the tragedies of colonial violence. This too, the ACM has begun to grapple with. 
And I look forward to this new phase when we will begin to see and hear more narratives about friction, discord, disunity, and resistance that do not portray our world only through rose tinted glasses. And I think I'll stop here um, as it's eight o'clock in Singapore and um, we should um, start on our conversation, I guess, and our um, discussion with um, Conan and Faisal, and then um, move on to the Q&A. Conan, or would you like to respond to some, sure. of, some of, or would you like to ask some specific questions? Well, well, I actually wanted to start off by um, the discussion by um, um, actually, um, thanking um, Conan and Faisal for um, giving, um, I guess, those of us who teach Asian art histories a challenge to go beyond the traditional canon of what we include in our lectures by um, uh, getting us to look at um, these um, objects that we just simply walk past in the galleries, um, such as those um, um, uh, precious but humble ceilings or, or the chili that um, Faisal was uh, bringing attention to. Yes, we try to, you know, we do send the students out to the ACM, or 200 of them, the first years, um, uh, for their presentations. And we try our best to encourage students to go beyond the, you know, the Buddhas, the Gandharan Buddhas, or the walking Buddhas, or the Ganeshas, or the beautiful Chola bronzes. But uh, um, but in um, getting us to really uh, look carefully at these objects, um, I think um, gives us a uh, maybe an opportunity for us to try to see how we can include them in um, our own lectures in, in, and then slowly starting including them in what we teach as part of the canon. Um, but your um, talks also touched upon a couple of other issues, the issue of um, collecting and of course collectors. And I was struck by how, um, you know, the, the title of our panel um, has a famous um, collector's name, um, 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 a Western colonial collector. But then when I listened to your talks, I was also hearing the presence of uh, local collectors or, um, um, other collectors and other types of collecting. And, um, and of course, I'm also thinking of the galleries themselves. Um, I'm, I'm, one of my favorite galleries is the little gallery that's nestled between the Singapore Archaeology Gallery and the Maritime Trade Gallery that highlights those uh, wonderful um, um, ceramics, the medicine jars, or the alum textiles, and which, which clearly tell us that people in this region were collecting, were collectors. And, um, and, and perhaps they were collecting different types of objects from what um, the anthropologists and the uh, adventurers and the um, naturalists uh, and the missionaries started collecting um, that sort of formed the earlier um, colonial collection of um, the ACM. And, and also I'm thinking of, um, um, you know, when we also um, think about um, uh, uh, narratives of uh, plunder, um, I'm especially thinking of um, the, um, one of your final exhibitions, Stephen, um, um, uh, Jimmy Ong's, um, installation, and when we listen to that narrative of plunder of the of the palace, um, or or we um, or when I when I think of my own research, um, um, uh, the plundering of um, um, the temple of the tooth relic or the royal treasury by Portuguese uh, troops um, in the 16th century in Sri Lanka, or we or we think of the kingdom of Benin being plundered and all those beautiful bronzes being taken to London. In these narratives of plunder, we also hear of collectors and collections. So I'm just wondering, how do we begin to start, um, I guess, moving away from this emphasis of colonial collections and colonial collecting to start looking at how um, local collections and collectors were also collecting? I guess it's kind of a broad question for both of you to get us started. Yeah, th thanks a lot, Sujana. Maybe I can kind of take it first, Faisal, if you don't mind. 
yeah, I, I think, okay, to, I think the first thing is that there's a bit of a, an error in the title, I feel, because yeah, it, it says Raffles Collection, but actually it should be Raffles Museum Collection, because obviously the Raffles Collection all went, you know, to the British Museum, um, and, and, you know, some of it was lost uh, in, in, at sea. Uh, but uh, so, so it, yeah, it's, it's, it's interesting that, uh, of course, so the Raffles Museum Collection was really built up by, by many, many collectors, not just uh, those uh, associated with uh, colonial uh, uh, sort of occupations, um, but but also um, as you know, in in the very first place, the the the, the opening of a museum, the museum component of the Raffles Library and Museum, uh, actually began in in 1849 with the donation of two gold coins by by the Tamangong uh, Ibrahim of, of Johor. So in a way, in a way, the the collection really began with those two items. You know, can't really find it, find them now in the collection. You know, the record isn't really there, but um, I would say that is indicative of how, you know, there was really a buy-in from from all all uh, sectors of the community um, when it comes to collecting. Um, in uh, but you know, obviously we can't deny that uh, violence was uh, definitely a, a big part of of uh, or one of the forms of collecting in the colonial period. Uh, although I have to say that um, uh, uh, with some you know, notable ex exceptions, um, the, the majority of, uh, as I said, the, the Raffles Museum collection was, uh, a big part of it was uh, zoological, and it was really um, uh, uh, collected by people in, in sort of these scientific expeditions uh, to collect samples of all sorts of um, uh, different uh, 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 specimens in the region. Um, uh, yeah, just trying to... Kind of final, do you want to jump in? Yeah, sure. Yeah. Um, so yeah, I, I think you, you, you have a very good point, and it's something that we definitely are thinking about with regards to local collectors because some of these communities, um, some of our communities that we've been collecting, God knows how long, even before colonialism came into the picture, the Batak communities were collecting uh, different um, ceramics from China, for example, so were the Dayak communities. Uh, but we don't listen to, we don't highlight them as or we don't consider them collectors. Why not? You know, we should. Uh, they don't, we might not have their names, but we should at least kind of like investigate this phenomenon uh, and beyond just collection, but procuring of uh, objects from different cultures. They were, we were trading this Southeast Asia, the different communities were trading amongst each other. Uh, textile, for example, was one of the most mobile uh, products. Uh, so yeah, we just need to rethink about who, uh, who or why we classify certain people uh, collectors. Um, but also with regards to the colonial collection, why not we also think about um, the other side, about the people who are giving up their objects. So turn the whole story around or look at it from that angle, because some of these people were actually, I mean, we know tourism art, some of, a lot of the objects in uh, earlier Southeast Asian collections could have actually been more of tourist tourism art, or at least they were made for the Western taste and Western aesthetics. Or, but I guess wouldn't, I wouldn't call it Western aesthetic, but Western taste of what they think Southeast Asia looks like. Uh, so um, these people have certain agency on how they they sold, they made these objects. Uh, maybe we should also start looking uh, at those angles as well. Uh, so we can still deal with clone and collections, but let's look at all the players involved. Yeah. Can I jump in really quickly? Um, because there's actually the question that's got voted the most, I think directly deals with this. So I think it's probably good to interweave some of these questions mm -hmm. from the audience with the discussion um, when they relate directly. So on that note, yeah, uh, Fiona Tan has asked, um, all these great attempts to decolonize the museum and allow local communities to engage with these collections. Uh, I am curious if there are attempts to recover voices of the colonized from the past, as the communities might see their history and used, uh, used refer to these items differently. Faisal and Conan, you've both like spoke about this, but maybe this is a question, have you actually started looking at specific communities yet that you could work with. Um, I think it follows on nicely from what you just stated. So, um, I can start first. Yeah, I mean, uh, for, for me, I have. And I, that's one of my first go-to approach whenever I start researching on something, which is to try to find someone within the community, if not an organization or institution that I can 
you know, run ideas by or talk to. Uh, so with the Chile, for example, I was very lucky to be able to have a conversation with Irina Agravina. She's, uh, um, she's an artist and researcher from Jogjakarta. And um, I mean, it's not Balinese, but we had conversations about Dewi Sri and significance of Dewi Sri, and she gave lots of perspectives. And I'm trying, we are trying to do that with many other different communities. So with Ranu Alam Foundation, for example, I've spoken to them. Um, so yeah, it's it's baby steps for me, but um, the aim is uh, we have we have um, I guess a direction, uh, but the pandemic is making that a bit difficult, Stephen. But yeah, yeah, you know I think for for the the Hindu and Buddhist uh, objects in the collection, we haven't exactly um, began to to kind of do that in a very systematic way yet. Um, to I think you know with with our engagements with the uh, inter-religious organization in Singapore that um, you know we alluded to. Uh, we we have been trying to get um, so perspectives from members of those religious communities to to actually react to objects in the gallery that uh, are from their their religion. Uh, but I don't, I don't know if that's really what the same as what you would say you would you know the, the questioner um, would say it's the same as recovering the voices of the colonized uh, peoples at the time. I, you know because obviously um, that it's, it's it's not the same thing, right? Like you know these things are collected. Uh, um, you know, the places where they were collected from are not, it's not, it's not the same as, as, a, as a local community here in Singapore um, appreciating these objects. So I'm not really sure if that's an answer to that question. Although, you know, uh, from, from what I try to do in my presentation today to try and, to try and um, uncover some of the, um, how, how communities were actually, uh, you know, from, from where these uh, clay tablets that I was talking about, where they were taken from, uh, how, how they were actually in, uh, interacted with, with the local community communities. As I said, you know, the, the Buddhist monks would be actually taking them and, and you know, instead of putting them in a, in a vitrine uh, on display, they would actually grind them up and, and use them to make uh, new, new um, uh, Buddha images because they had, had this kind of power. And I feel like there is a lot more, which there are opportunities for this in the colonial record, even obviously it's, though it's imperfect because we're not, you know, really listening through the voices of the, the people, just, you know, descriptive. Um, but I think there is potential there in the research that we do. Yeah, I think you hinted at it with as well the the fact that the ceilings were discovered in an area that is now primarily um, the populations are primarily Islamic, so they would have uh, focused on them as a different way. So it would be interesting to sort of reconnect with those communities, you know, in present yeah. day. You know, there is I think there's there's definitely scope for it. All right, so I suggest that you have any one of um, well, I mean, I'm thinking of, um, you know, it, it is a challenge to try to recover those voices. I mean, one could start looking at um, um, the artwork and, and, and see what, you know, what, what kind of uh, traces these um, uh, communities have left behind. I think um, Conan was certainly um, uh, alluding to that in, in the way uh, the seals were used. And um, um, sorry, I'm, I'm in a room where um, there's a sensor. And if I don't move, <laughs> it, the lights go off, which I forgot. So, um, um, but I'm also thinking, I'm sort of, when I, that question and then Faisal's and Conan's responses and, and, and uh, reminded me of some of the own work that I um, do on these um, Sri Lankan ivories made for the Portuguese court and how, um, uh, how Portuguese troops um, sort of destroyed these temples along the coast of Sri Lanka and how it has been such a challenge to try to uh, recover the art history of um, uh, those regions. And it's, it's only through these ivories and, try, and, and um, it's, um, you know, you can only do it to a certain extent, um, trying to figure out what, uh, what um, you know, uh, not what life was like back then or what the carvers are trying to um, um, depict in those um, images. But it's something that we, we need to do. Um, so. Okay, I think I'm going to um, address some of the other questions as well. Actually, what I'm going to do is there's two or three questions that interrelate and touch on sort of some key topics about not just what we're talking about today, specific to ACM, but also the whole question of decolonization. Um, 
So I'll sort of try, I'm gonna try and frame it into sort of a larger picture so that you can, maybe then we can answer it um, as sort of one question. Uh, the first is Bradley's who's been upvoted as well. I mean, he's, so he's really looking at the issue of positionality and uh, you know, who gets the right to speak for, for who, right? Who can speak about these issues? Um, you know, he says it's virtually impossible to talk about cultural colonialism without mentioning racial equality. Um, who in academia has actually got the voice, students and scholars alike. Is it, of course, it is traditionally, and you could even argue still over representation of say white scholarship. Um, so again, who gets who gets to speak on this? Where should the balance be? Where is the, who gets privileged, who doesn't? And then Andrew Tan has a question and a comment. Um, so I'll deal with the question, not the comment. Um, is, is decolonization, really what he's saying is this just a fad, right? Is decolonization just a fad? Is it just the latest academic, uh, you know, thing that we're all getting excited about? I, or has it, is there an actual, is there actual value, a heuristic value to it? Does it move discussions forward in a meaningful way? Um, I think is what he's saying, uh, or he's questioning, uh, challenging uh, what we're doing. Um, and also, you know, how do we judge, his comment is, you know, how do we judge colonial collectors, you know, the limitations that they're under and the conditions they collected under, should we, you know, I guess that's another common critique of decolonization is that perhaps we're judging the past by today's standards. I don't think that's what we're doing, but I think that is something that needs to be addressed and maybe that can be, um, you can maybe address that issue. And then, um, sorry, I'm scrolling down, Dr. Hilmi. I think this is the other, for me, what's also an important aspect is if, okay, if we get rid of colonial narratives, um, what replaces them? Uh, do we replace them with national narratives, with localization narratives? Um, you know, because if we create a vacuum, obviously, then it'll be filled by something. So I think there's, I think you've touched on a lot of this already, but maybe you just want to sort of think of those three questions, comments, and, and how you would respond to them. I think in the ACM context, though, or within what you've spoken about today. Well, there's quite a lot, quite a lot to unpack there. Uh, I, I think, I think I, I I will begin by, I think this is the important thing is to say that I don't think decolonization is a fad. Uh, I think it's actually really integral to uh, the museum uh, remaining relevant, remaining uh, important to, to communities where, 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 wherever they are. I mean, whether it's in previously colonized countries like Singapore and Indonesia and so on, or, or in, in the, the West, right? In, in, in uh, you know, the British Museum, the Met, uh, these all need to decolonize as well. And it's not, it's not a matter of, um, I think uh, necessarily, uh, um, you know, doing away with everything that was colonial. Uh, I think that's uh, to me, it's it's kind of trying to to, to obscure uh, the histories uh, of you know our, 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 our nations, you know, where we are today, uh, the cultures. But it's it's about trying to understand them better, to to contextualize them better. So, kind of yeah, going back to to the you know, are we the question of are we trying to judge. Um, the, uh, uh, these collectors, these colonial um, uh, you know, museum curators and so on in the past by today's standards, uh, I don't really think that's um, the right way to frame it. I think it's, it's about trying to, to historicize uh, them in their, in their context and to, you know, I, I think it's, to, it's kind of to uh, address this sort of balance, right, that, um, you know, where, where uh, in the past, in, in, in past uh, colonial discourse, the, the colonial voice was seen as the, 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 the most important or at the top of the hierarchy. But now what we're trying to do is to try and equalize the other voices that have been forgotten or, or ignored or kind of uh, um, uh, somehow silenced and to try and put them on the same level uh, uh, through kind of doing this kind of historicizing work. And I think that that is really decolonizing to me to, um, to, to let in all these other narratives and other perspectives um yeah okay um, yeah. <laughs> yeah yeah um well I, I think firstly with regards to the question about you know who gets to tell these stories right i think uh both Kun and i even sujatha have already mentioned about 
community voices. I think that needs to happen. And I know it's tricky sometimes. People don't know how to deal with collaborations, but we need to start collaborating with people across the globe. I think there's no excuse anymore to not do it. Um, you know, we like to work in our own little bubbles, in our own little laptops sometimes, but sometimes it's best, um, you know, and, and that allows you to be able to make sure it's collaborations, I mean, true collaborations, not commissions, you know, collaborations. Uh, would probably yield the best results. So you make sure that you are not uh, act enacting what the colonials were doing. And I mean, and with regards to the word decolonization or decolonizing, you know, it, it gives a term for something that many of us have already been thinking about, especially, and, as, and going back to the previous question, especially ethnic minority scholars and academics and curators or anybody in the field, we just, before the word colonizing was, well, a fashion, fashionable, the fact it was difficult for us to find uh, something to latch on to uh, methodology even, but this gives uh, a voice to it. Um, and I know when people think of decolonizing the museum or anything, uh, one of the first things they think about, oh, we want to forget the past, we want to judge the past. We don't really, we want to keep addressing the past. We kind of love the past, you know, we won't be in this field, but with a different, with different perspectives, with new lenses, with different lenses, diverse lenses, wider lenses, because much of the building blocks of academia, the academic world, the museum world, the perspectives and the approaches were built upon mostly Western ones. So we just want to make sure that we make it richer, uh, bringing in local and regional and alternative perspectives allow that. Uh, so yeah, so that's what it means. I know it sounds very scary to some people, uh, very aggressive, but it's actually not in my opinion, yeah. Yeah, actually, that makes me kind of think again of the question of what do we replace? Uh, what do we what replaces the colonial right? And to me, actually, the colonial is is a state of mind where where one group of people, you know, a, group, a privileged group of people, is is seen as above all else. Uh, so, yeah, in a way, I guess we are trying to we are trying to undo that, uh, but it doesn't mean that the voices of those, uh, you know, who who were at the top of the whatever hierarchy or even today. Um, uh, are completely silenced. And, and actually, I think it's a call also to, it's not just about the past, it's about the present as well. I mean, who, you know, it makes us think who are the privileged voices today in, in our society? Who, who gets to speak now? Uh, and and as, as curators, we, you know, we're also trying to, I, I hope, right, we're trying to address that as well. And, and, and I think maybe there's a different issue altogether, but I think one of the things that we're doing at the museum to address this also is, uh, with our accessibility programs to try and make sure a lot of um, other community groups and communities that don't necessarily um, think about going to the museum as, as something they do every day or, or you know have you know issues that prevent them from enjoying our collections fully uh, and the way it is presented now we are, we're also trying to slowly um, you know in very physical ways as well uh, to make those our collections more accessible to to all um, in, in in well in Singapore and everywhere else um, yeah so, yeah, so Jana, do you have something, do you have something to, to say? To um, I mean, you've both covered everything so beautifully, but I was also, um, you know, um, thinking about um, uh, what we can do, I guess, in uh, academia since um, some of, I guess, um, um, one of these questions talks about cultural colonialism and academia and students and scholars having a voice and and even just simple things which both of you alluded to like getting students to just um go to the museum um, you know for some, some of them it might be even the first time when they write in their uh, reflective essays or in their diary that they sort of weekly uh, reflections and um um or, or just getting students to also not only read um the knowledge that's produced in um centers of knowledge production uh, in, in, in London or New York or, you know, um, these um, universities in the US. So, uh, but also um, in making sure that we include um, um, essays, um, articles, books written by um, scholars producing knowledge in um, Asia, just little baby steps matter. Um, and, um, so, um, you know, it's, it's um, and, and, and also going back to the question on, I guess, um, you know, what are we going to replace it with? Um, uh, yes, it could be a na national narrative, um, but it could, and it could, it could be localization or, um, or looking to the region or, or looking, to, uh, looking at global connections. But um, 
it's um, you know it's it's a it, it's a challenge to um, do these um, re completely replacing um, 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 colonial narratives because as some, uh, one of the questions I think also um, mentioned um, something about how we have to rely on these colonial officials um, and, and of course we do we acknowledge them that that, that um, they were collecting and they were writing. Um, but um, you know, it's it's um, it, it's always a it's always a challenge, I guess, trying to figure out um, uh, what 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 this decolonization is, whether it's in academia or in the museum world. Right. Yeah, I don't have anything to add to to what you've all said, but actually, I wanted to pick up. I, I, if you don't mind, we'll we'll keep going for about another five ten minutes. Uh, there's still a few more questions I'd like to address, but. Faisal triggered something for me earlier about language, and I think it's really important as well, because there's a whole discussion about decolonization and language. And of course, again, this is, you know, one of one of the aspects that we've also there's also been workshops in Southeast Asian contexts about how to, de, you know, about issues of translation or, you know, publishing in native languages, Southeast Asian languages. Um, because again, that creates barriers if everything is, is in English, French, or Dutch, right? Depending on sort of the regions you're, or Portuguese, maybe in the Sri Lankan context and so forth. So I think, again, it's not, it, again, it's not just, it's not about doing away with, with, with English language scholarship or not referring to, you know, a, a well-known professor in a U.S. university. It's just about actually realizing that there could be just as much valuable information or completely new perspectives in as Faisal has shown in you know in literature that's written in, in in a Southeast Asian language. So that is that's another question, right? Another issue entirely about about um, about language issues, but it's completely I think related. Um, all right, I, I'm going to take the next two questions together as well because they they actually address the same issue, and that's a, that's a very specific one to ACM. Um, Azam Cesar asks about about the you know the usual the colonial viewpoint of, of Islam and how, of course, in the Raffles collection and so forth, it's completely underrepresented. Um, so how, how should museums address the absence of Islamic objects in their display and the religious heritage of the re region? I think ACM is doing that, but maybe one of you would like to talk about that a bit more. And then Christine Tan has also asked a, a, quite a specific question on, on, on collections, but she's more interested in fashion. So she's asking, um, She's curious how you would look at historical dress in the same decolonizing context, uh, both in terms of how such traditional garments are still worn in the same way as they were decades ago, and how also some ways dress has drastically changed because of colonialism. So maybe you could maybe you could address one one each. Maybe I think Conan's been working on on the fashion a bit recently as well, so he might want to take that one, and Faisal may want to take the one on Islam. Um, yeah. Or, or vice versa. Uh, maybe I'll start. Well, yeah, go ahead, go ahead. Okay. Um, well, I, I mean, yes and and no. I mean, I think like with regards to the, uh, collection, especially the old Raffles Library Museum collection, yeah, it might seem like we don't have Islamic objects. So we need to also start thinking about what it means when we talk about Islamic objects as well, right? And that's a bigger discussion in itself, uh, because um, there were far stricter categories in the past and what we can deem as Islamic objects. But some objects, for example, in the Malay Peninsula, uh, they might not look like Islamic objects. They were also part of Islamic uh, uh, rituals or everyday uh, kind of um, rites of, and, 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 and stuff like that. Uh, and it's very difficult to pry what is Islamic and not from, uh, say, a Malay culture. Uh, so th th there are ways to look at it for, with some of the objects. So when I'm talking, what I'm talking about is like uh, objects like the Chris in certain Islamic traditions or festivals, or even just the use of certain textiles um, that might be uh, just, you know, non-sacred textiles, but they are worn for the everyday, which also include Islamic. Uh, uh, kind of rituals and moments and uh, festivals, for example. Um, we also need to start uh, being open to the idea that something can be both Islamic and, say, Hindu or, and 
for this. Uh, I mean, for example, we most of us already know things like uh, objects like the uh, the wayang toping or even the wayang kulit were also used for you know dissemination of Islam, for example. Uh, um, but you know these are not things that were tackled or addressed by uh, the earlier collectors. So, but I do agree that some of the uh, objects uh, that were I guess quintessentially Islamic, for example, um, headstones or batu nisan, for example, they're made of wood, we might not be able to have them. But I guess that's where we have to do the, you know, reparations right now to make sure we have these objects that are current uh, or even acquire from the community. Um, and, and I think we also need to think about intangible uh, heritage as well, uh, collecting those kinds of uh, documentation, for example, because a lot of uh, the also the objects of this region they are perishable they are meant to you know be consumed over time so uh, those things need to be considered so we can start doing those legworks right now I think yeah yeah exactly I, I think uh, the the remedy to to um, you know the absence of Islamic objects in the collection is really to start this thing Islamic Islamic objects in the in the museum. Uh, and, and sorry, and, and can I just add, I mean, and also our Islamic God curator, Nora, she's doing a lot of that already. So we, that's why I think our Islamic art gallery is uh, pretty well done, in my opinion. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah, I mean, uh, the, the Islamic gallery, which is part of our faith and belief galleries on the second floor, is I think the only, one of the only galleries of Islamic art in the world to feature the art of Southeast Asia, to center Southeast Asia in that, in that global uh, conversation. Um, and, and you know this requires also a lot of research uh, on the collection itself uh, where many of these objects may have been um, you know kind of not not noticed or, or silenced as, as you said um, and as for fashion I, I think I think it's a similar actually it's a, it's a similar maybe a similar thing in the sense that a lot of the objects that the ACM has been collecting over the years uh, and, and even from the, the Raffles Museum time uh, objects that um, of, of Asian fashion have actually been categorized as, as ethnological objects. So they've been categorized as, as costume or, or you know, you know, maybe life ceremony garment and, and so on. And, and I think so it is like a miscategorization to, to, to us now. And, and what we've been trying to do at the museum now with the opening of our fashion and design uh, galleries in the third floor is really to try and, and look at uh, our past, our old collections, and also to, to you know grow our collection uh, to to Re, to rethink um, this idea of fashion, you know, it's just not, we don't want to limit it to just, you know, the, the idea of haute couture, which uh, haute couture, uh, high fashion really comes from a very specific moment in, in the colonial metropoles in, in Paris and London in the 19th century. We're trying to expand that, that um, view of fashion, um, that uh, in, in Asia and Southeast Asia, there were actually many, many different um, uh, forms, many different um, uh, Types of fashion that were developing at their own pace, you know, without without any necessary interference, any um, external interference. So, so that's really what we've been trying to do at the museum. I, I hope, hope uh, I've addressed that that question. Uh, yeah. Hi, right. <laughs> I'm, I'm aware. I'm conscious of time, so I think we should uh -huh. probably wrap up. Unfortunately, there was. One, there's a few questions left that are all interrelated and um, maybe I will just sort of raise them, but we should, because I, I think they will come up in, in later uh, talks in the series, um, Adrian talks about, you know, again, the definition of, of decolonization, it is a lot, I think it's a, it's a term that, that encapsulates a lot of different aspects. Um, and he says it was not what he was expecting. It, is it not ideas about ownership, power and origins? I think you definitely, Address power and origins, um, but ownership, of course. So I think this is where we're getting into, you know, questions of repatriation and so forth. Um, and I, I would just say that I think in in um, lecture five, Ricky Pandazan will definitely, I think, talk about those issues in more depth in terms of the Philippine collections in Michigan. And I think the talk next week may touch on it as well. But yeah, of course, I think it does. I think decolonization, obviously. Um, refers to this, these, uh, talks about these as well. And, and uh, Francis Locke had also asked a similar question about, uh, is there ongoing efforts to repatriate or digitize artifacts um, that originate in Singapore, uh, but were extracted during colonial times? Um, I don't know if any of you want to comment on it really briefly, or we just bring it to a close. Um, 
but I thought it was just important to acknowledge the, those two questions. All right. Um, maybe I'll just quickly say something. I mean, um, yeah, I think repatriation is uh, always a, um, um, a possible part of the solution. It's not going to be the solution. It's part of the solution um, um, because it's not always useful for every case. Um, and, you know, and I think some of the previous speakers from the previous sessions have already mentioned this also. Um, but as I mentioned earlier, some objects uh, in the ACM collection were sold by people from their respective communities to collect, you know, uh, to be collected by the by by the Western colonials, uh, the Western colonial collectors, for example. So, we need to also respect those kinds of um, agency. So it's really very tri tricky for some of these objects. So it might we might be we have to really identify the context of each object first. So and it's possibly um, not a not a solution for every single object, right? So, uh, yeah, but it's. For certain objects, when it's really, really very obvious, you know, where it's really questionable, I think a lot of those cases um, we've already seen in the media that this is a is a solution that lots of museums were actually open to. Yeah. If I may just say one thing before we close, and just to note that actually, you know, um, you know, the, the work of decolonizing museum is also not only the, the province of the curatorial department. And definitely at the ACM, uh, our, other, our colleagues in the other departments, you know, audience, which does programming and education, marketing, uh, all, the, all the other departments in the museum are, are as, as important in, in you know, decolonizing what we do at the museum. And actually, this is already a very big change from the colonial period where like, you know, the, the all-powerful curator making decisions and like, doing everything. Right? So, so I just wanted to, to acknowledge, I mean, even though this webinar series is called uh, decolonizing, you know, decolonizing Curating and the Museum, um, a lot of what we've talked about, me and Faisal today, are actually also the work of our, our other colleagues in other departments as well. So, so yeah, just, just would like to, to acknowledge that. Absolutely. Yeah, I think museums have, I think it, the, the, in the broader context, museums have evolved over to say the past 30 years to become more public facing as well, right? So now we have a whole range of departments and professions within the museum, as opposed to definitely during the raffles period or even up until the 1960s and so forth. And I think, again, I think it's really important for, that Conan's brought it up because this, you know, the, as museums evolve, this, these questions of decolonization, I think, become much more relevant and engagement with local communities and so forth. So yeah, I think it's, we should frame it within broader developments of museums and museology as well. But yeah, on that note, I think I will bring this re really great discussion to a, to a close. I think we covered a lot of really important points today. And thank you for the questions as well. Really great questions from everybody. Really great to see people uh, not only at, questioning but challenging as well that's what we like to see um yeah and that's just uh, all that's left for me is to thank uh sujatha for being a wonderful discussion and then of course uh, faisal and conan for their excellent discussion today and the audience so hopefully i'll see some of you next week and um, that's it from us good night thank you everyone thank you